the top 10 best and most popular peptides currently available. So I'm going to talk about what the peptides are, what they do, what the dosing and timing of the dosing is, and if they actually work. Along with some crazy protocols that most people are not talking about that I have a lot of relative experience with. So we're gonna kick this off with probably the two most popular peptides called the Wolverine stack. And this is going to be BPC-157 and TB-500. Now, you guys, I am personally going to say I've been using this for over a decade before people even knew what it was. This is being used behind the scenes with professional athletes athletes, whether you want to believe it or not, most people are usually five to up to a decade behind the curve on these things that are being used. And that's why this is so much fun for me. So let's talk about it. BBC-157 is not only just good for soft tissue recovery, it's a massive anti-inflammatory. In fact, one of the things that people do not know about this peptide, it is amazing for your gastrointestinal system. That's where our body naturally produces BPC-157. So you can use it to help to heal intestinal lining. Not only that, but due to the fact that it does reduce down inflammation so effectively, sometimes you see the microbiome, so your bacteria in your gut, getting into a better position so your digestion improves. On top of that, you get soft tissue regeneration like tendons and ligaments, which is really what it's well known for. Now, typical dosing on this is 500 micrograms per day, but we're gonna talk about a crazy protocol here in a second, combined with TB500, which is basically its sister. TB500 is a synthetic peptide, predominantly good for soft tissue and muscle recovery more than anything else. Now, before I go into these crazy protocols, and that's why I have so much experience in this, they are still not used for human consumption yet. TB500 is very cool because they use this for a front loading technique, which I've used to heal my torn hamstring in literally seven days. I ruptured it from the knee and the glute at the same time. So I was praying I didn't need surgery and I didn't. Now, traditionally the Wolverine stack looks like this. 500 micrograms of BBC-157, 500 micrograms of TB500. And that would be done at a daily basis. However, the protocol that I did was very much different. TB500, because it can be front loaded, I used at a five milligram dose. So I did TB500 at five milligrams one day, five milligrams, 2.5 milligrams, 2.5 milligrams, one milligram, one milligram, followed by the maintenance dose of 500 micrograms, which puts you back down to that baseline that most people would be doing with BPC-157. Now, BPC-157, the most effective protocol that I have seen in myself and others is actually splitting up the dose two up to three times per day. When I had this issue, I actually did it three times per day at 250 micrograms, amounting to 750 micrograms. Now, what people don't talk about BPC-157, unlike TB-500, is that you can do a massive dose of it and probably get slightly anabolic properties out of it for net recovery. So do these work? I have seen this work time and time again, even though there's no human data on it. Which brings us to number three, which is probably one of the most popularized peptides currently available in the market, which is going to be semaglutide and ozempic. This is a traditional GLP-1. Now the major issue with this is going to be constipation and massive digestive issues, including things that might hospitalize you. And yes, I have heard horror stories and seen horror stories of people having to go to the hospital because they're vomiting. Now, if you wanna go way more in depth, we do have a school community where we do way further education and way more in-depth guides into peptides and the performance space to build bigger, better physiques as well as healthier people. So typical medical dosing starts at 0.5 milligrams, goes up to 2.4 milligrams in obese cases. 1.2 milligrams is the mass for a diabetic because it predominantly helps with insulin sensitivity so much. So these are more popularized as weight loss agents more than anything else. Where I have found it effective without really side effects is 0.1 milligrams to 0.2 milligrams for insulin sensitivity as well as appetite suppressing effects, which is very counterintuitive what they do in the medical space because it gets so expensive and well, people wanna make some money somehow, right? Now jumping into something that resolved some of the issues with the digestion is trisepatide which is a GOP-1 and GIP. So the whole point to implementing GIP in it was to help with the gastric emptying issues that you had with traditional GLPs. Plus it's a 50-50 blend, so there's less GLP-1 in it and there's GIP in it as well, making it four times more well tolerated than the traditional semaglutide and ozempic. Now, typical dosing in the medical space goes from like two to four milligrams as a starting dose, all the way up to 11 milligrams, which is absurd to me to think about when you hear what comes next. What I have found effective is one week at one to two milligrams. I don't really find it ever needing to go above that. Now the appetite suppressing effects are not nearly as strong as traditional GLP-1 
Which brings us to the third generation, which is not currently human approved, but there are human and clinical research on it, is retitrutide. So retitrutide is a GOP-1 plus a GIP plus glucagon. So glucagon is that metabolic agent that's going to help with weight loss as well as shuttling that skeletal muscle glycogen. Now the benefit is not only are these weight loss agents, but as they're going through generation two to generation three, you tend to see the weight loss effects held even after they're done with it. And retitrutide blows the water off of the other two when it comes to weight loss, when it comes to performance, and when it comes to not having rebounds. And again, the dosing, which will probably be FDA approved for around 11 milligrams, I guess up to 14 milligrams with their crazy numbers that they're doing right now. I find one milligram to two milligrams of retitrutide plenty effective. Now there are some people out there that are doing between four to eight milligrams of it. The whole key is to get insulin sensitive. And when you become more insulin sensitive, you start to drop weight. And it also helps to control your appetite a little bit. And with retitrutide, it helps with shuttling with skeletal muscle glycogen. So it can actually make your muscle tissue look and feel more full so your performance in the gym actually increases. Now, jumping into some things that improve cellular performance would be something like a MOTC. MOTC help to replicate mitochondria and therefore increase energy expenditure. And due to the increased metabolic expenditure, the body is going to be working more efficiently. Working more efficiently equals dropping some inflammatory markers, probably improving overall health as well outside of just increasing metabolic expenditure, which will reduce down body fat as well. So MOTC, the typical dose would be 500 micrograms daily. The time of day does not really matter on this one. Now jumping in one for your immune system is going to be KPV. And KPV is a fragment of alpha MSH. Now this one is very cool because the only real point that I wanna hit home on is actually your gastrointestinal system. So there are certain things that it does like reducing down inflammation and driving up things like melanotan, which can help to increase libido. There's even some research that shows that it may help with neuroprotectivity as well, so to protecting your brain. But the really cool one is your gastrointestinal system. They are applying it to see if it helps with Crohn's and other irritable bowel disease. So people that have things like IBS, this may be a great tool and option to lean into to see if it helps you out. And typical dosing is 500 micrograms daily. Going into the next two, which are usually run in tangent together, is CJC1295 and Ipamorlin. Now, Ipamorlin is FDA legal, so it can be scripted from your doctor. It's one of the few on most peptide lists that are actually legal for human consumption with good studies to back it. Now, I talk about these in tangent together because one is a growth hormone releasing hormone, which is CJC1295. The other one is a growth hormone secretagogue, so it is categorized as a GHRP. When run in tangent together, you have a higher odds of increasing your growth hormone production naturally. When you increase your growth hormone production naturally, you get a conversion to IGF-1, which causes cellular proliferation, such as muscle hyperplasia and the creation of new muscle tissue. This can also boost up your immune system and that's what they actually use it for legally. But most people that are doing this want some performance and they want some hair, skin, and nails, and that's what growth hormone and IGF-1 is great for. And growth hormone can also aid in fat loss. Typical dosing on both of these is around 200 to 300 micrograms per day, and I personally, if I'm doing this, I would be doing it before bed. Some of the downsides though, is some people do have a drive up of ghrelin, which makes them more hungry. So if you're having an issue like that and you're trying to lose weight taking these, probably counterintuitive. Which brings us to our bonus, which is IGF-1 LR3. Now IGF-1 LR3 is really popular within the bodybuilding space for trying to put on muscle tissue because again, IGF-1, when it converts to MGF, which is mechanical growth factor, causes muscle hyperplasia. So it can literally copy these cells of muscle tissue. It's the only way to actually create new muscle tissue rather than just getting muscle tissue bigger. We do it very well when we're a kid, but not when we're adults. We only have muscle hypertrophy happen. Now, this one comes with a massive double-edged sword though. Unlike taking things to drive up growth hormone or getting growth hormone, where it tries to segment out those cells to really repair the body, this is kind of like throwing a shotgun into the equation where it's just trying to replicate cells. So the major risk is if tumor or cancer cells are present, it tends to replicate them. In fact, the major manufacturer of direct IGF-1 
is called Incrolex, and you can go to the website and on the first page, the warning label there says it very specifically. I find that IGF-1 usually isn't worth it. However, it's popular in the bodybuilding space. It's going to increase skeletal muscle glycogen at the bare minimum. Not everyone actually responds as well as they think they do to it. It's actually just more carbs being stored in the muscle tissue. And dosing protocol usually goes as follows, usually 20 to 30 micrograms, up to maximum 50 micrograms as a pre-workout. Why is it pre-workout? Well, you want IGF-1 to increase when you're in the gym and training to not only shuttle glycogen into the muscle tissue, but hopefully starting to copy and replicate those cells. If you have an opportunity to, when the trauma happens to those cells, you want to try to replicate them and repair them. If you found this video helpful, I love a like and subscribe. And also if you're interested in seeing more peptide content, let me know in the comments down below.